I'm here to introduce uh, Tim DeBlock. Tim really just wanted me to mention that he's an awesome Overwatch player. And that is, that is fair. So I don't begrudge him for wanting me to remind you all of that. Uh, but you are here to see a Kickstarting Application Security Program. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to Tim now. All right. Hope everyone. <laughs> Thank you for the kind applause. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed lunch. Um, I know coming back after lunch is not the easiest to go listen to a talk, so hopefully it won't be too boring. I do pace, so James is going to have to be on his toes. Um, but yes, as Chris mentioned, we'll reiterate kickstarting an application security program. My name is Timothy D. Block, and we'll actually just go ahead and get right into it. We need an AppSec program. That is the phrase that really started my path to application security and getting into the field. Um, this slide is here to make a point, and probably the most important point about starting an application security program is that you need leadership and management support. If you don't have that, it's going to be very difficult to get anything done from building an application security program. The fact that they did come to me and mention that we wanted to build an application security program, right there I have their support. And I have, you know, there, there have been instances where the developers were ready to release an application and the CIO said, has this run through security yet? So especially getting something off the ground and getting the development team involved is going to be key for leadership to really support you in that, that, uh, that aspect. Um, I've been very fortunate to work at this. And then we're going to walk through two journeys uh, that I've taken building out application security programs. And um, I've been very fortunate to have leadership support throughout. And that's all the way up to the executive branch. So why this talk? Um, well, this talk is because when I was asked to build an application security program, I didn't have a strong programming or development background. I didn't have an application security background. So I'm starting from scratch. I come from the infrastructure and operations side of IT. So I was a network admin, system analyst, things like that. But we still had a job to do. So um, what I did have was experience building out other programs, so incident response, patch management, some of those different types of programs. Um, and what I've found is that those kind of programs go along with building out something like application security. So that's if you have programming or development background, uh, that's, that's good. If you don't, that doesn't mean you can't build out an AppSec program. Uh, it just takes a little bit more hard work, a little bit more work to get that done. Um, so this talk is for people who might be in a similar situation where they're starting from scratch and don't know where to start. I've talked to people who have, are currently building an application security program and just either need that confidence or kind of some more ideas on building it out. And then, interestingly enough, I have run into some consultants who have taken some of the ideas away from this and wanting to interact with the development team uh, better and with the, with the, with, within their clients. So if, especially if you're a consultant, um, after this talk, if you could give me any feedback, that, that'd be great. So this is my overall roadmap for building an application security program. Uh, we'll cover the first three in this talk. The last two we won't. Might do a future talk on it. They seem fairly obvious in feedback and review and improvement opportunities. So don't know how much is actually really there to talk about. But um, we will get into understanding the environment. Uh, then putting security assessments and processes in place, and then training. And training is a big, big one for me. Um, so as I said, we'll go through two journeys. My first journey starts in Columbia, South Carolina. And I'm working on a security team of about three people. We have a development team of about 10 to 20 people. The advantage I have here is this is a known environment. So this is uh, where I got the we need an AppSec program. So I'd been there for a year and a half. I'm not actually starting all the way from zero. I've had some interaction with the development team. Uh, the disadvantage, though, is that I'm wearing multiple hats. So I have to maintain 15 different security appliances, uh, antivirus, email filter, web filter. So I have to be really practical with this program. Um, the other thing worth mentioning is that this is a waterfall methodology. And for those that don't want to understand what waterfall methodology is, it, it's like uh, water coming down a set of steps. So there's very uh, defined steps throughout the process. And this can take anywhere from uh, months to, well, anywhere from weeks to months. So it's a very long cycle. Um, the counter to that, and, and probably what's really popular now is Agile, which is more like a, anywhere from a day to four-week cycle. So 
Uh, this one is a little bit more easier to get uh, application, well, security as a defined step in there. So my first step uh, is research and building out an AppSec program. And I went to everybody's favorite IT tool, Google. And I actually put in how to build an application security program. I literally Googled that. Um, but if you notice here, there's some interesting results. There are three results there from the oh, from OWASP, which is the Open Web Application Security Project. This is a massive nonprofit uh, open source organization where you where they have like knowledge bases, and then they have uh, projects which have frameworks and tools. And this is this is where I got started. This was my first step in this environment um, is to. I worked with a tool called, or heard about a tool called Zap, which is a Z attack proxy. Um, there's an alternative to that, Burp Switch, which we'll talk about in a minute. But uh, Zap is what I use because it was free to download, free to start working with. It was created by a guy named Simon Bennett, who works for Mozilla. He's a developer, he's not a security person. So he's trying to uh, write more secure code, and he wanted to write a tool that really helped with that. And to really to get started with this, I just read the documentation. And the document, it's very well documented. Both of these are very well documented. There's a lot of YouTube videos out there. Um, the methodology for something like this, oh, okay, so uh, step back a minute. Um, these are proxies. So what they do is, for anyone that doesn't know what a proxy is, it captures all your traffic between your computer and the application. And then what that allows you to do is map the entire application. So for for these, the methodology is you want to go and click on absolutely everything in the application. From there, and this is submit every button, fill out every form, click on every link. From there, you can run some tools or run some scans with these tools. So you'll spider the site, uh, then you'll do some Ajax spidering, which if you have Ajax content, uh, there's a forced browse directory, which will go hit, look for hidden directories in the application. And then after that, um, you can do an active scan, which is actually where it will look for the vulnerabilities. So it'll run through path traversal, it'll run through SQL injection on your application. From there, you're able to then generate a report, usually in HTML or XML format. Um, so what we did was we set up a minimum of five days of testing. And usually what that entailed was two days of testing and then three days of remediation or longer, depending on the vulnerability. So we had that, that step defined within the process. Um, and that seemed to work pretty well. Burp is, is the alternative. It is actually the preferred dynamic analyzer for, for uh, most people I've talked to. It is $300 a year. There is a free version. The difference is that it's throttled, um, or some of the automated scans are throttled. But for $300 a year, that's really not a whole lot. Um, the biggest difference I've seen between these two tools in talking to application security professionals is that they like Burp's UI layout better or they feel like it's less buggy than Zap. Um, technically, I haven't really seen a whole lot, so both will get you where you need to go. The, the, I've started actually testing out both tools on the same application, and the biggest difference I'm seeing outside of UI is that there's a severity rating difference. So what Zap rates as a medium severity rating, or it might do a lower information. Really, you shouldn't be relying on your tools to set severity. That should be based on your environment, your mitigating factors, things like that. Uh, another set of tools is static analyzers. So the difference between static and dynamic. Dynamics, interacting with the application. Static is testing code in its rawest form. So you'll take the code, put it in a zip file, and upload it to these analyzers. It will go look through the code it doesn't have any context. So there's gonna be a lot more false positives with static analyzers. Um, you have two varieties here, open source, which is free, usually focuses on one language. The commercial versions, which are expensive, will have multiple languages, kind of depends on your organization, what's gonna fit best. Um, I have noticed that the open source, there's not necessarily an open source static analyzer out there for every language or not really a good one. Um, and as you can see there, there's an OWASP page. A lot of this stuff has their own OWASP page here to kind of go through. Um, I will say static analyzers also kind of help with, uh, are really good for automating. So as developers are coding, when they start uh, sending it up through their uh, non-prod environment, that can be scanned and checked for issues. It will require a lot of tuning though. So, 
So vulnerability tracking. Um, this is where I ran into my first kind of issue with uh, building out an AppSec program. So we're finding vulnerabilities. We start touching on some of our older stuff. Uh, and we find, uh, so we go talk to the developer about it. They say that they give us a timeline for the fix. I actually come a month afterwards because I completely forgot about it, asked them where they're at, and they said they hadn't even started it. So, and I was trying to track this stuff via email, spreadsheet, things like that. Wasn't working out so well, so uh, I decided I needed a tool. Ideally, you'll find something internal. So whatever the developers are using, you want to go ahead and use. Security findings are nothing more than bugs, so they should be prioritized the same and addressed the same way. Now, if that's not an option or you really want to use something, secure, some, something focused on security, you can do that. Um, Dradis is where I started. I actually failed. I couldn't get it installed. It's in a lot of the frameworks out there. So um, Samurai Web Testing Frameworks, Samurai WTF, it's in there. I think it's in Metasploit and some other stuff. I have talked to some people uh, who have used it and had some very positive things to say about it. Um, I found that we were trying to set it up on our own server so multiple people could log into, not just a VM on our own machine to track these vulnerabilities. Um, documentation was pretty non-existent, so it became very difficult to find it. But what I did find was ThreadFix, and they had a community version at the time. Uh, since then, they have Nix support for the community version, and it's more of a paid product now. Um, but we were able to get that installed, set up, and we were importing XML uh, files into the tool for us to track. Uh, we could pull metrics from it, do all sorts of different stuff. Um, if you're looking for a free version, oh look, OWASP has one called the Defect Dojo. I've actually recently started using this myself, um, and it's great. It's, it's a really easy setup. I've got it set up on a Ubuntu VM. And it will import reports from various different tools. Um, and then from there, you're able to kind of dedupe them. So if you have multiple findings in, the, in different tools, that's very beneficial in itself. Uh, it integrates with JIRA, so you can automate some of this stuff in that once you've got, you know, figured out what you're doing with it, you can push it out to JIRA so that you can just have a ticket created. Um, I did this because I fell in the same, kind of the same trap I did before. <laughs> and um, I was finding, finding vulnerabilities. I had a ton I needed to go confirm, and I, start, I pulled out the spreadsheet, and I was like, wait a minute, what am I doing? I got Defect Dojo, been wanting to try it out spun it up, and then that was really beneficial in making it possible for me to kind of um, track this stuff and kind of confirm stuff. I can mark stuff as false positives. I can do verified, uh, all sorts of different things. And then what is great is that it takes the reports from each tool and will automatically uh, populate those fields, so mitigating factors, things like that. Um, it's got metrics in there. There's a demo available on their OWASP page for you to go. Uh, click on, log in, they give you login information, you can go check out, you'll see other people have actually been playing around in there. So how to handle vulnerabilities, that's, that's something I think is very important when you're talking about an application security program. So, we are finding vulnerabilities and we're generating a report. The very next thing you should do is confirm your findings. Do not take false positives to the development team. If you waste the, the devs team with false positives, it's going to be, make it very difficult to continue to work with them. You can take them nine actual vulnerabilities, you give them one false positive, and you've just deprioritized all nine. They are already under a lot of stress to you know, meet business timelines and deadlines, um, security coming in, and creating more work for them and work for them that they didn't need to do in the first place is not going to make you many friends. So we want to work with the development team. Um, for me, not having a programming background, I was asking a lot of questions. And they are very much open to, ask, to, to uh, you asking them questions because it shows that you're trying to actually understand it and work with them on it. If you're just handing them a report and walking away, that, that, that's not really going to get you anywhere as far as getting security vulnerabilities addressed. Um, in my experience, they usually know what the fix is, too. So I've had times where, you know, if, if nothing else, I, I knew how to actually exploit the vulnerability. And these reports are really great for that. 
and that they will give you the URL, the parameter, the method, and then the attack code. So you'll have everything you need to go confirm the actual finding. Um, and I, I have had instances where we had SQL injection, and I talked to one of the devs about fixing it, and they wanted to see it, so I showed it to them and showed them the attack code. We did SQL injection, and their response was, hackers are so, so smart. So they have an appreciation for this kind of stuff. I've had people come up, and after I showed them cross-site scripting or, or whatever else, they actually think that's, they think that's as cool as we do. So um, if nothing else, make sure you demonstrate the vulnerability. If neither of you know, and there have been rare occasions where that's been the case, it's time to hop on Google and try to go figure this out, figure out what needs to be done for the fix. You should be, be there as a resource as much as they are. So training, let's talk about training. Um, as I started implementing these tools into the development lifecycle, something interesting started happening. They wanted to learn, wanted to know how to do these tools. So I'm finding these vulnerabilities, it's a check, uh, they wanted to understand how I'm finding this stuff so that potentially they could do it before it even gets to me, which is, which is great. So I started doing one-on-one -on -one and group training with the development team. And I did, you know, I was probably not the best approach, but I, I so I, I showed them how to install, install OS Zap, which is another benefit to Zap is that it's free. So I can have it installed on all the dev machines if I wanted to. Uh, but I had them install it. Uh, and then on the front of Zap is like a, an attack URL field where it's like a getting started thing. So you just dump a URL in there and hit attack and it goes out and finds this stuff. That's a, actually a very, very shallow scan. As I mentioned, you want to go click through everything. So I hadn't told them that and um, they went and fixed those vulnerabilities with the getting started uh, attack button. And then I got it and I found a little bit more. Um, and they were like, well, how'd you find that? So I'm, I'm, I, I, you know, then I sat down with them again and showed them how I went through the application and was finding a lot of this stuff, which is really great and really um, benefited me in that we had a security incident come in. So we had a phishing email, uh, reports of a phishing email that uh, when a user generated an account on our portal, they would get a phishing email after the fact. So we all got together, had a plan of action. I was going to go research the phishing email, see if it was something specific to us or if this was something that other people were going to see. And uh, they were going to go gen generate a new user, see if they even got the email in the first place. Um, I had intended to go, go back through the, the, the registration process and run Zap through it to look for any potential vulnerabilities, maybe some cross-site scripting. This is kind of how I address stuff, is as stuff came up, I would go test it with Zap, even though it's not in development. Um, and so we all, we all, went, you know, we all went broke. I went and re researched it. Didn't have enough time to go generate the, register the new user. I'd have to do it after our meeting to get back together. But we came back together, and the developers, um, well, I, I, the research found that there was no, the phishing email wasn't specific to us, so it was happening in other places. It's a good indicator it's not something within our registration process. But they came back together, confirmed that, that there was no phishing email with the new registered user, and then they handed me a Zap report. This was my response. Yes, this is absolutely one. They, they've gone ahead and done something that I was planning on doing. I didn't ask them to do it. They were being very proactive. And this is kind of where I had my epiphany. We want to improve the, the dev's mindset, and I've done that through chaining. But there's this concept of moving left of the process. So we've set up a security assessment for the application. We now want to get as far left into the development process as possible. That's design meetings, code review, QA, wherever you feel like you can get security into the development lifecycle. The earlier you catch it, the better it is. Well, the furthest point left of the development life cycle is the dev mindset. So if they're happy to use the tool and they're, they're finding these vulnerabilities and fixing them, and then you know, as they're coding, they're like, oh wait, I, I had an issue doing this last time. That, that right there is avoiding, the, avoiding a security issue down the road. And it's saving us time, money, it's making the process more efficient. So we talk about this talent shortage in our industry. And we talk about it, it seems more in the application security field. Um, we should be leveraging the talent of the development team. That's, that's where training really comes in and it come, becomes beneficial. 
you know, I, I can't have, I, can't, I really can't wait for people to go through school and, you know, I have a daughter that's eight year old. I can't wait for her to get interested in security and actually join the field. So, um, again, I'm also being very practical with it. So if the developers are going to help me out with security, that, that's even better. It's going to make things run a lot better. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of confidence. These guys are really smart and they're really starting to hear about security or, you know, have some security knowledge already. I mean, how can they not with the constant news of breaches and other things happening, you know, in, in the national media? Um, and I've seen a developer write like a two paragraph long thing about like a security item within their application. And then the last sentence is, but I'm not a security person. And it's like, no, that's exactly what I want. That's how I want you thinking. So sometimes it's just a matter of boosting their confidence, telling them that uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is how we should be doing things. So that was my first journey. Uh, my next journey is definitely different. And that's because I moved to Nashville, Tennessee. So I am part of a uh, security team of about 10 to 20 people. We've got about 50 plus developers, so much bigger scale. I am also working in an agile uh, methodology. So I have to be really smart and embed security within the process. The advantage I have is that I am hired to, do, to build an application security program. That is my sole role. I am actually going to go sit with the devs and help them with security in their development lifecycle, which is an awesome role. Uh, the disadvantage, though, is that this is an entirely new environment for me. So I have a lot of catching up to do. But that's my first step, is understanding the environment. Um, for me, it takes me three months to get the gist of an organization. Six months, I'm starting to feel a little bit more comfortable. And at one to two years, I'm really confident. So this is, this is something that's going to take a while. And there's a point here in that these aren't like steps. These are more guidelines, phases, whatever you want to call them, um, that I will be understanding the environment while I'm starting to still, what, what, I am going to be under, still understanding the environment while I start putting security assessment and training in place. Um, and each, each environment is, is, is going to be unique, so it's going to vary based on what you're doing. Um, what I am trying to avoid, though, is, is introducing chaos, which I need to understand the environment before I start putting stuff in place. Otherwise, I'm going to create roadblocks, bottlenecks, and it's going to make it very difficult to work with the development team. And again, I'm sitting with them, so they will come over and yell at me. Um, so this is a picture um, of Johnny Christmas at B-Sides, Nashville, 2015, talking about uh, how to meet people at conferences. Um, and this applies to my first step, which is building relationships. I want to get to know them as a person. Um, another resource that's out there is How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. That is, will really help you in building relationships with people. And we build relationships with people because security is intimidating. And we need to show them it's not. We need to show them that, you know, we are a lot alike. We like the same memes. We laugh together. We like the movies, music, you know, whatever. Um, they're introverted, a lot like a lot of people within our industry, too. So, um, you know, building relationships with them is, is what I've found is key. And I've had instances where I've asked for something from a security perspective or security need, and they've dropped what they've done to, to go and help me. And that's because I've built a strong relationship with them. And, you know, that's one instance, but there's also instances where we're going to have to come to them and have hard conversations. They're going to respond better if you've built a good relationship with them. Um, if you're looking for a group of people to start with, I would start with Scrum Masters, business analysts, product owners, managers. Uh, those are the people that have to make sure the development work gets done. Um, you know, they're building tickets and then making sure it gets pushed through the process. That's where security needs to be. Security needs to be in all phases of the development lifecycle. So I will also attend meetings, and I'm trying to get in every meeting possible, daily, weekly, monthly. And this is just to observe. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be security focused. I will be there to, at stand-ups, even though there's no, no security items, just to listen in and understand what they're working on. And my, my, I'm observing because I want to understand their goals, their challenges, and their frustrations. 
Uh, this allows me to be a lot more tactful when I need to get something done from a security perspective. I'm also there to gauge security acumen. So I want to see what they know from a security perspective. Um, I want to um, understand and who I can rely on and who maybe I might need to work with a little bit. And there are going to be some devs that you just, they're, they're not going to, they're doing only, they're doing security because management's there supporting you. Um, but there are some other devs that are very much into security. They don't necessarily want to go into security, but they see the, they see the benefit of it and they see the under, they understand that quite a bit. I've had instances where I've sat in a meeting and seen them make go down the, uh, a wrong way for, from a security perspective. And I'm like, okay, I sit back, I'm like, let's see where they go with this. And they most more times than not, they make the right decision. And then I don't have to speak up and say anything. They know you're in there if you're there as a security person. Um, so me giving them the, 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 the thumbs up kind of just boosts their confidence a little bit. And I'm also not, you know, being the guy that's constantly, oh, we got to invite Tim to that security meeting again. Um, you know, I'm not that type of person. I'm there letting them do their job. That's not to say that if there is a big security issue about to come up, you know, you shouldn't speak up. Um, but try to do it in the form of a question. What's the problem we're trying to solve? Have you thought about this? Let me try to understand this a little bit better and why you're doing that. Um, try to kind of guide them towards making the right decision. You'll, you'll have people respond a lot better than, you know, get defensive right away. Inventory all the things. So these are logos, and this is about a fifth of the logos from my, that I pulled from a bigger infographic about all the technology used in the development lifecycle. Uh, I'm sure many of you can look at this and go, yeah, there's an issue there. There's an issue last month. Um, this isn't unlike asset management for operations. This isn't unlike computer networking uh, asset management. You need to have an understanding of what's your environment. If there's a vulnerability that comes out, patchy struts, you need to go then patch that stuff. Um, you know, we're also going to be looked to as a resource to secure this stuff. So do you, do you know what you need to do to secure Docker? Because they can make decisions on Docker that can lead to a security issue or a security incident. Um, my strategy for doing this, and this, this is going to take a lot of time. There's no easy fix for this. This is going to be something that you have to, you know, sometimes it's just sitting there listening to them talk about uh, a technology that they want to use. Um, but I, I, I go through, I have a set of questions that I've built out, um, you know, things like how many developers are on this, how often are they released, and, uh, you know, how many contributors are to it, things like that. And so I, I put, I document all that. Um, if there's code available, I will throw it through the static analyzer. And if there's issues in there, I will, you know, sit down with a dev and go, let's, let's walk through this and kind of see what's going on. Because there are times where there's a vulnerability, but that's just how the, the thing operates. And that's going to be dependent on, you know, what your business function is, whether or not you can use that. Um, and we have, so we also have the compliance team, which for big things, so for third party vendor type stuff, uh, they will do their, their checks on that kind of thing, um, making sure the proper legal documents are signed, things like that. <laughs> so now the fu fun part. Um, setting up uh, assessments and processes uh, is the next phase. And we want to start at all new applications and features first. The reason why we started all new applications and features first is that if you start at some arbitrary point within the environment, you're just going to be constantly playing catch up. You're also going to create a lot of, a lot more work for people in that, uh, they're working on these new features and you're looking at some old technology. Um, so you, you want to start at the point where they're, they're, uh, currently at. And if they go back and touch something, that's when you want to do a security assessment. So within, within, like I said, within Waterfall, we set up the five day process. That doesn't work in Agile. Within Agile, uh, we have to automate as much as possible. We have to flag stuff that will need to be tested and so that they're aware of the timeline for that kind of stuff. Usually they're in smaller pieces, so it doesn't take five days to go test one uh, form or uh, anything of that sort. But we are trying to automate as much as possible. There is a resource, OWASP Pipeline. 
Um, and that has a lot of uh, technology and a workflow for people to use as a reference point for building out uh, an application security program and, and pretty much a continuous integration, continuous deliver uh, type of model. Um, I will say that the pipeline is, seems to be more of an enterprise level, but there are de there's definitely technology there to pull down and, tr and try to use. Again, each, un each, un each environment is unique, so it's kind of hard to really say what works for yours. So what works in my environment isn't necessarily going to work for yours. What worked in my previous uh, organization doesn't work here. So you, you have to be really flexible. And again, we're trying to avoid bottlenecks and roadblocks as much. If, if there are bottlenecks and roadblocks because of security, those need to be reviewed and a better way found. Um, so that, and as part of this, we're also implementing processes that make sense. I typically look for, for opportunities to do this. Um, a lot of these result from developers asking me questions uh, from a security perspective. Um, one of my first ones was third-party vendor assessment. So how do we do that? Uh, in the past, uh, they made a switch from one vendor to another and didn't inform the security team. When the security team got wind of it, it was, hold on. We need to make sure, because, because of where I work, we need to make sure that all these legal documents are signed. Uh, you know, we do a proper assessment and put that in place. Um, so they wanted to actually avoid that scenario again. And they were, so we, we set up a process to where we, we uh, set a timeline so they knew what the timeline was for how long com the compliance team would need to go through the third party vendor so that they had an ex expectation of that. Uh, then we created a checklist of things that would get them an automatic no from the compliance team. So they're already going in with a good idea of whether or not it's going to be approved. Um, and we, we said that it, it was as simple as that. Um, and sometimes these questions can lead down rabbit holes that read down to other security findings and had a couple of things like that. And that led to me creating a security ticket process was my next thing I set up. Keep in mind, I, I set these up within the first two to three months of being on site, sitting with the development team. So th these were not set up down the road a year afterwards. These were set up pretty quickly. Um, I'm still trying to get my feet, and we're already having to set up some of this stuff. So we had to find a way to set up or have security findings work throughout the development lifecycle, prioritized properly. Um, so I aligned with what the, so one of the problems we had was that bugs were coming in from all different areas of the business and they were trying to funnel it through one location. Um, and so I was like, okay, cool. Well, I can, I can work with this. I can do this. So we, we sat down and talked about how security tickets should get in there. Uh, we're using our internal bug tracking system and um, I'm starting to follow the process. So they had a bug severity process where we marked it as like S1, S2, S3, S4, which is critical high, medium, and low. So it, it lined up perfectly with that. The bugs had a timeline for getting fixed. So at that point, I now know when my, when, uh, my manager comes to me and says, how long, are they, how long will this take to fix? I can give them a timeline. Um, and then for them, I'm kind of enabling them a little bit because when other departments or other businesses aren't following the, filling out the form properly or doing all this, they can point to me and go, security's, security's doing it. So at that point, then I'm, I'm kind of enabling and helping out their process that they're wanting to get. Uh, set up and established. I'm giving some credibility to it. And I'm hopefully maybe getting my stuff prioritized over other people. So, uh, so training. And I want to focus on training again because it's very, very important. As I said, I got my epiphany from training. Um, but I also kind of advanced my training ideas. And I brought bacon and swag. That picture there is 144 pieces of bacon. That is two 72 packs of pre-cooked bacon from Sam's for 20 bucks. Um, 10 to 15 minutes in front of the microwave, one tray, dropped in the conference room table. The look on the developer's face when they came in for security training was priceless. Is that, is that bacon? <laughs> Who doesn't love bacon? Um, that also allowed me to segue into piggybacking. Um, <laughs> And, and kind, of, uh, kind of talk to them about, hey, we need to reel this in a little bit. Um, and so I, after that, we went and watched a YouTube video of a guy trying to get through a man trap uh, and was failing miserably. <laughs> he had like three forms of authentication. 
uh, was two to three minutes. Just when he got to the door, it just stopped. So he had to go through the authentication process again. And then at some point, he figured out he should just put the server in before he gets going. Um, but make, make training interesting. And, and again, they like YouTube videos. They like funny things like that. We can use some of that stuff to make points about different things. Um, memes, a lot of the same slides I use here is kind of the same thing I go with training. Um, and I also like to bring swag. And I bring swag to highlight security wins. We, talk, we, we, we are the bearer of bad news enough in security that if we're not bringing them something good or something or highlighting something that they're doing good, then um, it, it, they start tuning us out. So I like to highlight security wins. And, and more, pretty good chances they are doing something. You could look for the silliest little thing if you want to or something that you think is very, very small. I've got a developer using a YubiKey. I highlighted that. Um, they're also using security. They already had security tools in place that they were using. Um, they, they, some of them will find issues in code. You know, whatever you can find to kind of boost their confidence a little bit and, and um, make it a point to provide something that they can, you know, they can lean on versus some, you know, bringing them something bad to talk about or have hard conversations. Um, and again, I, I highlight security wins because I want them to respond better when we have some hard conversations. And we're going to have to talk about internal issues, boring new processes, potentially lessons learned. Um, you know, it, it's not unlike the concept of social engineering, where you try to you know, relate to someone before you do you know, exploit them. But this, this, this is more of an, in an authentic way. This is you trying to you know, improve security. Um, we're not going to get them to, I don't know, not get them to let us into the data center. I don't even have access to the data center. But, um, you know, oftentimes, I, for the first week I was there, stink eye, fish eye, and all over the place. They knew I was a security guy, didn't know what I was about. As I started building, converse, you know, building a relationship with them, they, they eased up. I heard things that, you know, wanted to go then, we had to go resolve. Um, to this day, though, they still, when I walk up to the desk, it's it, it's it's like oh what do I do now what, 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 what I just want to see if you want to go to lunch man um, so you know it, it's it's something that we kind of have to overcome here and that, that's why I like to highlight security wins before you know so I can have better conversations with them about this um, another thing I like to do is add relevant news so who here has heard about the MongoDB and ransomware uh, earlier this year yeah see I've got a lot ton of hands up uh, I had a conference room full of developers, none of them rose their hands. So we had a good conversation about MongoDB and why default settings are bad because there's no authentication and it just goes and grabs a public IP. Um, we had a good discussion about ransomware, what, is that, what it actually is and why it could potentially cripple our organization or cause an incident. Uh, and, and from there, we also had, you know, they started asking questions about, well, how does this happen? So I pulled up Shodan and I said, here's Shodan. <laughs> Everything's out there for you to search. Um, so we had a really good conversation about uh, security misconfiguration, um, different things going on that maybe haven't happened yet at the organization, but could in the future, and we really need to be uh, looking out for. Um, you know, kind of talking about attacker motives and their strategy. So after MongoDB, they moved to Elasticsearch, and then they moved to CouchDB. Do we have any databases out there that they could potentially get into and start throwing ransomware on? So that's it. That's, that's my basic steps for building an application security program. Achievement unlocked. You've just stood up an AppSec program. Um, but now what? Well, there are some frameworks out there. BSIM and OWASP SAM will measure the maturity of your application security program. I actually haven't gotten into that a whole lot. Um, because it, it, I haven't felt the need for it just yet, but if you're looking for a structured thing, that could be a, a, a potential thing. But this, this, this apps, building an apps like program doesn't have to be something super complicated with all these pretty things and all these different things in place. Just, just you know, understanding the environment, setting up some assessments and processes that are going to make a real impact in your security program, and then uh, doing some training with the development team. So uh, another thing, again, hopefully in a future talk, feedback and review. Um, I have asked the developers recently what their biggest pain point for security was. I was actually happy to get back that it wasn't me. It was actually something on our infrastructure side. Um, but um, 
Yeah, I mean, you always want to have a dialogue with them about what's, what's, you know, what's going on with security. Is it something that, that they're seeing I'm, I'm doing a good thing with or a bad thing with? Uh, if, you're a, if you're not a programmer, um, work, at better, work at becoming a better programmer. And there's plenty of resources out there. I have spent a lot of time on Code Academy. I love Code Academy because it gives me a terminal. I code it. And then before I move on to the next phase, I have to make sure the code is correct. Uh, you've also got things like, I like Pluralsight, too. Um, it's got a lot of technology courses. It's got some security stuff on there. It's also got a lot of development stuff on there. And those courses can range anywhere for, from an hour to nine hours worth of content. That's a lot of good content. A lot of them, especially on the development side, will have you download, like if you want to learn about Docker, it'll have you download Docker and start playing with it while you're going through the training. Different things like that. Uh, code fights and code combat are more of a fun thing. Code combat is more of a RPG type of learning to code thing. Code fights is something where it's got like puzzles and challenges. Um, code.org, I have an eight-year-old daughter. Signed her up for that just so I could learn to code and spend a little quality time with her. Um, W3Schools is a great reference point. Um, they kind of have some coding as well in there that you can play around with. I probably at this point use it more of a, as a reference when I need to understand something uh, from a technology development standpoint. Uh, you also want to keep up with the application security field. It is an ever-evolving, ever-changing thing. Uh, SANS 542, the um, Web Application Penetration Testing Course, is what really made things click for me from an AppSec perspective. If you're doing this on your own, $5,000 might not be something that you can afford. Um, I had the organization pay for it, but Tim Tomes uh, is doing the practical web application penetration testing course. Uh, he is at DerbyCon. There's a waiting list at this point. Um, he's doing it at DerbyCon. That's $1,200 for a DerbyCon training course. Um, he will do stuff in the southeast. He goes to local chapters from a lot of, you know, OWASP chapters and ISSA chapters. He's been up to Boston. Um, if you're, I feel like a sales pitch now. Um, if you're an organization, he will come in and train your developers to do this. And what I love about his course is it's two days of breaking stuff and then two days of fixing stuff. I like that in training for, for application security. Um, Bill Semp is focused uh, right now on mobile. He's, uh, I just had a podcast episode with him on, on uh, Android, um, and he's working on iOS this year, forensics. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, DevelopSec is, is done by James Jardine, and it, that focuses on developers. It's a podcast aimed at developers, so it's some good stuff there. Uh, Brute Logic is doing some amazing stuff with cross-site scripting. Uh, he's doing some really advanced things, so if you really want to learn more about cross-site scripting, he's the guy to go to. And then the Web Application Hacker's Handbook, uh, pretty much the Bible of application security. It's 800 pages of application security goodness by Defad Studer and Marcus Pinto, um, who uh, Defad is also the creator of Burp. So if you're looking to learn more about Burp, uh, that book is very, very good for that. You, it has Burp screenshots in the book, and we'll walk you through how to actually test for the vulnerability and, uh, different, and explain it. Um, so final thoughts. Uh, my role was a liaison role, which is why I got Tim, Tim Simkowski on there. Um, I explained my role to Tim Tomes, and he made fun of me and said, you're like that guy from Office Space. Um, but that's actually what it is. That's how it was described to me in my interview process. I am bringing security concerns to the development team, and the develop I, but I'm also taking the development team's concerns back to security. You know, this, is, this was to strengthen the collaboration between the two departments. I interviewed with security and development people. Um, they were looking for someone to come in and not tell them their code sucks. They didn't want that. They wanted someone that was going to come in and be a resource for security, provide them uh, with um, ideas for improving security within their application security process. Um, as I can say, sit with, uh, if you can, sit with the development team. Um, I actually am a proponent of trying that out for every other department, too. Have someone sit with the networking team, have someone sit with the, sit with the system administrators. Because, again, building those relationships is going to really help the security team make more of an impact and get things done. Um, so my final point, and this is my motto that I, I like to take when I'm working with the development team, and really anyone from a security perspective, is that we're, the security we're here as enablers. And we're here to help the business work. 
Um, so I try to put developers in a position to succeed. If I'm not doing that, if they're not getting what they need from me, then I am, I am failing as a security practitioner. Um, so that's pretty much my talk. I run the Exploring Information Security podcast. Uh, it, I have a different security professional on each week to discuss a different InfoSec topic. Um, there's my Twitter handle, my website, and my email if you want to contact me. If you're looking for uh, an opportunity as a security engineer, a junior pen tester, come talk to me after the fact, and uh, I might have a position for you. You have to move to Nashville, though, which isn't really that bad. I upgraded going from Columbia, South Carolina to Nashville, so <laughs> depending on where you're at. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much the talk. Questions? Yes. The slides? Yeah, so I'll throw the slides up on my website. You can email me. If, if I don't put them up, I'll probably put them up out of Twitter. Um, yeah. Yeah, they'll be, they're, they're Google Docs, so it's just an easy share. Let everyone view. I might, you know. Yes, sir. Uh, so yeah, we set up, what we did was we set up our, in our internal ticketing system, we set up our own security board. That was kind of though for me to track stuff better, so I could just have one board to go to and go, okay, what's the status of this? And then if something's not being addressed within the timeline, I can go bug them about it. And then from there we could pull our different security, or metrics. But along with that, in their own workflow, they were able to move that ticket along. And so it was being tracked uh, a lot as the same as, as other bugs. Um, yeah. Yes, sir. So this brings up a story for internal development. Um, have you had to apply tables to um, vendors? No. Kind of came up before. Um, no, no, we haven't. No, I'm, I'm just going to say no. There, there have been times where we've, we've had to work with other vendors because we found issues within their own stuff, but. No, we can't really apply this to them. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I love, I love that interaction. So for anybody on YouTube um, that didn't hear that because they're not mic'd up, the question was um, uh, working with uh, vendors as far as their development process. The short answer, and you, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, is to build that into the contract. Right? Cool. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Not you. Um, so I'm going to go back to the question was on the, the how, how, do I, how did I choose to go language after or what, what language to study. Um, that was, so I mean within my environment I knew what they were going to do. So I was actually remote for the first two months of my employment and they gave me the opportunity to say, hey, we know you don't have a strong development background. Here's what we're using and then go and, and learn it. So it's kind of, it, there's so many different languages out there. I mean the joke is there's a new JavaScript framework every week. So um, I'm not trying to keep up with everything. I'm trying to, one, I'm trying to get principles. So there's some good courses on like basic principles to get started with application or with, with programming. And then just whatever we're working on. And if they're looking to move towards a language, then I'm trying to get ahead of the game there and study that up too. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was, I was just curious. So you talked a little bit earlier Right. And that's just the flag is something different. Right. Um, and then you, you'll find a dozen people and give you a dozen different justifications for this, their own idea of it. Is, 
is part of your role in in this in this process to work to be with all the security team to when you're putting in new gear or what have you? Are you setting your own abilities? I mean, how do we feel to be more of a meeting for our environment? Yeah. So the question is, is are we setting our own severity rating? Yes. Yeah, so we'll, well, based on different factors, you know, it, there, there are some applications that are internal. It, okay, it, if, it, if it has some issue in there, I'm not going to rate it as high as something that's outward facing. Because, you know, these are also relied on for, severity rating is also relying on for priority and, you know, getting things worked uh, and, and resolved. To answer your question. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Go to the conference.